So we've got a special interview right now, and this is with Andrew Jones, he's a biblical researcher. Andrew, are you on the line with us? Hello, guys. Yes, I can hear you guys. Thank you so much indeed for uh, joining us, Andrew. Now, just to confirm, that is not a green screen behind you, is it? Where are you at the moment? No, this is not a green screen. I am in the mountains of Ararat in eastern Turkey. And right behind me is the Durupanar Noah's Ark site that was found in 1959 and that Ron Wyatt and others, including ourselves, have been investigating as the possible buried remains of Noah's Ark. Now, Howard recently did a late show on the Mount Sinai. I believe you had an opportunity to watch that and uh, you took some notes uh, yes. into that. Do you have any, uh, any thoughts, first of all, on that program? Oh, it's awesome. I'm glad people are really interested in the topic. It's been one of my favorite topics to research and go and investigate here in the Middle East. And so I'm happy that it's being shown around the world. Andrew, I just got to say that we do want uh, to honor you and, and, and say that just how much our, we at, at Revelation TV and our viewers really appreciate all the hard work you and the team are doing. Um, and we do think that uh, we're learning so much. But, you know, you, for a start off, uh, have done so much uh, in Saudi Arabia as well as there in Turkey um, with all of these great finds. But, you know, there, what's, uh, we have some questions uh, that I think n still need to be answered. Have you got those? Yeah, we've well? got some questions here, Andrew. Um, and this first one is, how long would it take, uh, would it have taken the Israelites to get to the proposed Nueva Red Crossing on the Gulf of Aqaba. 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 Yeah. So um, if you look at a map of the Middle East and you see that the Red Sea is divided into two gulfs at its northern end, the Gulf of Suez and the Gulf of Aqaba. Now, both of these gulfs have been proposed as the Red Sea crossing site. Um, but we're focused in on the Nueva Beach, which is... Uh, a peninsula or a, a large beach that sticks out of the western side of the Gulf of Aqaba, midway down the Gulf. And if you look at the biblical account, you'll realize that actually it took the Israelites between 45 and 60 days to get from Goshen to Mount Sinai. Right, that's a good Exodus one. Exodus chapter 19. Yeah. So you have this, this distance. And if you look at then where uh, the Red Sea crossing happened, it was in the early part of the Exodus journey. Um, and right after the Red Sea crossing, the next time point that the Bible gives in the chronology of the Exodus is when they enter the wilderness of sin. It says they were 30 days outside of Egypt. And that's when the Israelites started complaining about a possible lack of resources for them and their flocks and herds. So you only have this, this time point of 30 days and then uh, the third month when they arrive at Mount Sinai, and so the Red Sea crossing definitely would fit in um, between them leaving Egypt and this 30-day point. And if you look at Nueva, there's been different proposed uh, lengths of time to get to this Red Sea crossing site. Um, some people have said it's the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Seven Days of Haste. Um, and that's a, a Jewish tradition there, a, a later one, that just represents the time frame from Goshen to the actual Red Sea crossing, a seven-day journey. Um, other people said it took a little longer, um, so that seven days could possibly be from Goshen until their second camping place on Etham. Now, you remember in the Bible, it says in um, Exodus that after they left Sukkoth, which was the very first camping site after they had fled their homes in Goshen, they camp on the borders of Egypt at this place called Sukkoth, and there it says they traveled day and night, and they fled Egypt. And so that, that verse there definitely... Um, represents a time period of longer than a couple days. In right. fact, in Nehemiah, it mentions that the pillar of fire was to guide them in the way they should go at night. Yes. And so they did also night traveling. And so that, that, uh, that seven days journey of haste, where they only ate unleavened bread because they didn't have enough time to raise the bread, uh, that could represent the time till the next camping site of Etham, which has been proposed on the eastern side of the uh, Sinai Peninsula. So that modern um, road that goes across the peninsula today follows the ancient trade route that goes between Egypt and Midian and the Arabian, uh, Arabian Peninsula. And so you have this possibility of seven days, 10 days or two weeks to get from Egypt to the Red Sea crossing. And we do know from the Bible that they travel day and night. So there's plenty of time to reach this Nueva site and still fit within the 
biblical chronology of the Exodus. Okay, one, one question which came up on my live show, on the late show, um, and I'd only just read the scripture as well before I went live, but, you know, uh, when the, if Moses did actually cross that way you were saying into Midian, um, the, he meets with Jethro, um, and uh, after a particular length of time when Jethro had spent, you know, g giving him some advice about, you know, choosing some wise men to deal with sort of the day-to-day -day issues, you know, so that Moses wasn't absolutely uh, cream crackered, as they say, um, he does say, well, now I've got to go back to my own country. So if he was already in Midian, why would he say that term? I mean, I've got my own thoughts on that that came to me when I was on live, but what, what's your point? to prove that really Midian uh, has the real Sinai uh, mountain? Well, if you actually look at the, the whole story of where Mount Sinai is located, and we'll kind of a roundabout way to answer your question, uh, the first point I want to make is that when Moses fled Egypt after he had killed the Egyptian, you know, it says he went to dwell with Jethro, yep. and he married one of Jethro's daughters in the land of Midian in northwest Saudi Arabia. And the very first time that Mount Sinai or the mountain of God is mentioned in the Bible, it's the story of Moses seeing the burning bush. Exactly. In fact, it yeah. says that Moses was taking the flocks of Jethro. That was his 40-year job, was just taking care of sheep. Yep. And he took the flocks of Jethro up, and he saw this bush burning that did not consume on the mountain of God. And so if you look at a map of where Midian is, and look at the proposed, the traditional Mount Sinai sites or any other site located in the traditional Mount uh, Sinai Peninsula in modern day Egypt, you will see that he would have taken a long journey with the sheep to go all the way around the Gulf of Aqaba down into this mountainous, desolate area in the southern Sinai Peninsula. Which and is make impossible. Zero sense. Yeah, so if you look at what Bedouins do today um, with their flocks and herds, they, they do a migration based on the temperature in the seasons. So when it's warmer in the springtime, as it gets warmer, they bring the sheep from the valleys up into the mountains where it's cooler and they have vegetation to eat. And then when it gets colder up in the mountains towards winter, they bring them back down into the valleys. And so uh, this is probably what Moses was doing with the sheep. He was taking them from the lowlands where this traditional town of Jethro is in Alberta, modern day Saudi Arabia, this heartland of Midian. And he just went up into the mountains nearby, which is where we're looking at Mount Sinai. And this is uh, the Jebel Allah's range and the Jebel Makla peak. And so when Jethro told Moses, when he was at Rephidim, and he said, I need to go back to my own land, you look at that Hebrew word, and that can also mean not just another foreign country far away, but it can a town. also mean your own plot of land, like right. his place he lived in, his city, um, his home. And same with his uh, son, uh, Jethro's son, Hobab, uh, Moses' brother-in-law. It says that when they left Sinai, uh, Moses approached this guy and said, hey, could you guide us because you know where to go? And Hobab said, I want to go back to my own country. This is the Numbers, I believe, chapter 10. And so some people have used that as another example saying, look, here's a Midianite who wants to go back to his own country. And so this uh, area he's leaving cannot be Midian. Right. Well, if you look at it, Moses is actually asking Hobab, and they ignore the part where Moses says, hey, you know this area, please be our guide. So this was an area that a Midianite knew. This was not some faraway land over by the Egyptian mines in the Sinai Peninsula. This was in the outskirts of the land of Midian. Right. And uh, Hobab knew this area, and he just wanted to go back to his own tent, his own uh, area where he was growing up, just like Jethro said he wanted to do. And so that's uh, a, a good possible explanation for those two verses. Okay. What do you think about where I came up with literally on the live show was, well, hang on a sec. It, uh, if Moses was sojourning on this, you know, in the Exodus uh, route and he was in Midian, but he was saying, look, um, we're going north now and they were still with him as they traveled further north. He said, well, look, no, hang on a sec now. I, you're going up to... Uh, you know, almost towards Jericho, um, oh, we're going to go back to our land. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that would be for Hobab. It says that when they're leaving Mount Sinai, they're going to go up to the promised land. Yep. It's a possible explanation when he said, I want to go back to my land. Yeah. He didn't want to go up to Israel. The exactly. Land. He wanted to go back down yeah. to the area of modern day Albada, the yep. town where they believe Jethro lived, this heartland of Midian. And same with Jethro. If you realize, like, 
uh, how would Jethro know where the Israelites were at? I think you brought up this point on the live show. Yeah. If they were going um, in the uh, the Sinai Peninsula near the traditional yeah. Mount Sinai, they wouldn't and then Jethro find decides them. to. Yeah, Jethro and his uh, Moses' uh, wife and his two sons, uh, he brought them along to go meet up with the Israelites at Rephardim. Yep. Now, how would they know where to meet these guys? If, you know, that whole mountainous yeah. area. Send me a you know, pin drop. They had, yeah, they had no uh, GPS, no Google Maps. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it, absolutely ridiculous. But I think the thing is that what, I, what for me works out, and especially with the footage that you've been able to take um, uh, with your team over the months and years that you've been there, is that you, you can see the size of the peop amount of people that were uh, with Moses would not be able to encamp around Mount Sinai if it was in the Sinai Peninsula, but they could if they were in Sinai in Midian, or which is modern-day Saudi Arabia. Um, and that's why you had those people who were saying ridiculous things like only 15,000 people were on in the Exodus. Well, you, we did all the sums and everything of the genealogies of, of people over 400 years of exile in Egypt would have uh, amounted to uh, hundreds of thousands of people and that's uh, why it says in scripture 600,000 men let alone the women and children actually traversed and traveled through uh, from Goshen all the way through to the Sinai uh, desert and into Midian and then north into um, Jericho which they took uh, with God's help. Well, you can look at also the story of Balaam, which happened when they were still wandering and right before they crossed over into the promised land. So on the borders where they could see Jericho. Yep. So the, here they have this prophet who is trying to curse them. And it says he had to go to different high places just to see the different parts of the encampment of the, of the Israelites. Because the Israelite encampment was so big, there's not just one place that Balaam could see the whole encampment really? when he tried to curse them. Good point. And so, and yeah, if you look at that, you realize this is a large encampment, and it wasn't just a couple thousand people or ten thousand people. Um, they were spread out, and then they had different areas where they encamped. Yeah, and then you had that time in the in the middle of it all uh, when that guy actually rebelled against Moses, and uh, the, the the I think they lost twenty four thousand. So how could they have fifteen thousand only go out when they lost twenty four thousand, and still there was a whole <laughs> You'd bunch You'd be in of the people. negative, yeah. Yeah. You know, you can't do that. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, really good. And just keep up the good work, mate. We really do appreciate we it. We do. And Andrew. Revelation TV is behind you uh, to promote whatever. You and if you want to go on the tour uh, with Andrew and his team, you need to do that. We've got, We've got all the, the slate, details. The so slate, slate we're going to put on screen now for Andrew as well. We yeah. want to say a big thank you to Andrew because he's constantly sending us the latest yeah, footage. Amazing. He's constantly traveling all over the world, yeah. Saudi Arabia, Turkey, all over. And it's great that we've got this opportunity. But if our viewers want to get on some of these tours, amazing tours to see the real Mount Sinai in Arabia, then you can go on to Andrew's website, discoveredsinai.com, or you can email info at discoveredsinai.com. On a personal level, Andrew, let me just ask you as well, for our viewers who didn't see our previous interviews with you as well, is how did you get into all of this? Where did this interest uh, start? Well, I was actually in uh, middle school. I actually had an interest in archaeology and history as a child. I made a, a paper in Noah's Ark, had little animals to go into it. Um, but I first heard about these sites from Ron Wyatt. Um, he came to my town in Sacramento, California, in the western U.S., and it was a school night, so I couldn't go. I had homework. But my father decided to go and hear uh, what uh, this guy had to say, and he came back and told me, well, this guy claims, you know, that Mount Sinai is in Arabia and the Noah's Ark has been found. So I got interested. And so I went out and bought uh, Ron Wyatt's book, and, and then I decided I had to call this guy. And you know, I was just in middle school, you know, 13, 14 years old, and I called the operator up. This was before the internet, before email. This is like 91 or 1990. And I actually got a hold of Ron. And I used to talk to him for hours on the phone until he passed away. Um, and so, and then I finally went to the sites uh, when I was in college, first time to this site here in Turkey in 1997. And then the first time to Eastern, um, to the um, Northwest Saudi Arabia in 2016. And so I've been since that time. Uh, doing this research because it's uh, you know been a, like a, a life uh, long um, um, research uh, project for myself. Wow! Well, it's all bearing fruit. That's the great thing, Andrew. And uh, as I say, we're really grateful here at Revelation TV to be able to uh, 
give you the opportunity to share what you're finding as well. And it's quite interesting how Saudi Arabia have really kept things under wraps, I would say, for quite a few centuries, would you think? Yeah, in fact, that's probably why these sites were preserved versus being um, well known where pilgrims could come and you know, tear it apart or take pieces. And it's because it was Saudi has been a closed country um, until most recently when they issued the tourist visas starting in September 2019. Yeah. And so now you can go on a, on, a, on a tour or on your own. Yeah. Well, Andrew, we've got to let you go because we're nearly finished this program. Before we let you go, I'm going to read this email from Cynthia. This is for you, Andrew. It says, Andrew Jones, amazing. The best part of our mornings and it beats any newspaper readings. <laughs> Plus, we are getting fed with biblical resources. Thank you. And that's yeah. from Cynthia. Yeah. So that's some encouragement for you, Andrew. And keep going and keep doing the great work. Thank you. Well, all glory goes to God. Thank yeah. you, guys. Amen. Amen to that. We're going to put your slate on screen again, Andrew. So if our viewers do want to see the real Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia, then you can contact Andrew's organization. And uh, the website details are on screen as well, discoveredsinai.com. And he's also got a second website there, noahsarkscans.com. What a brilliant interview. God bless yeah, him. Yeah, love it, love it.